Oops, Google. Thank you very much. Okay, so we uh, start with a reminder of uh, what we did yesterday. So let me just, so in fact, uh, before starting with the development of the general theory, I wanted to consider three examples. So yesterday we considered two of them. So the sign process of Dyson is the one we started with. And so uh, the point process, so this one, uh, as I briefly recall, is the point process corresponding to the spacing between eigenvalues of the Hermitian matrix, of the random Hermitian matrix. So it corresponds to what Dyson observes looking at the Wigner semicircle, uh, what he observes around himself, the configuration of eigenvalues, is the, uh, is the <coughs> point process with the sine kernel, so the sine process. So this was the first example we treated yesterday. So the second example we treated yesterday, and uh, to which we will return later as this course progresses, is the example of Gaussian power series. So this is a point process with the uh, Bergman kernel. Uh, so uh, the kernel is K is a W, 1 over pi. 1 minus z w bar square. So this is the point process with the Bergman kernel. And this is the point process that governs the zeros of the random uh, Gaussian analytic function. So a n z to the n. So uh, if I have random Gaussian analytic function, then the set of zeros of this uh, function as uh, I formulated yesterday, the beautiful theorem of Peres and Virag, is a determinantal point process with the Bergman kernel, where the Bergman kernel is the kernel of the orthogonal projection from the usual space L2 of the disk with respect to the usual Lebesgue measure to the Bergman space of functions holomorphic on the unit disk. So square integrable functions holomorphic on the unit disk. Holomorphic. Holomorphic on the unit disk. So, uh, and the theorem that I formulated, obtained in joint work with Shu and Shamov, is the following theorem. Shamov is the theorem that, uh, in fact, I, I formulated in this particular case, but in fact it is holds in full generality of. Uh, the determinantal point process, the theorem that we obtain says the following, that if f belongs to the Bergman space, to the Bergman space, and f in restriction to the configuration x is equal to zero, then f is equal to zero. So this is a, a theorem, and uh, in fact it is a more general theorem. I mentioned that Gosch obtained particular case of our theorem for the sign process. Uh, uh, just, and we obtain it in full generality, so uh, we shall see that in full generality the statement, st uh, the theorem says that reproducing kernels of a determinantal point process uh, generates the ambient Hilbert space. So in this case, the Bergman space. Uh, the precise formulation will be given as the course progresses. So, and I would like to give a third example. So let me reformulate in other words. So the, in other words, let me reformulate. In other words, the span of the functions k, x over x and x almost surely coincides with the full Bergman space. So the statement that this statement holds was conjectured by Lyons and Perez, uh, uh, who also Lyons proved. Lyons proved such statement in discrete case and Gosch proved it under additional assumption of rigidity, uh, to which I will return in more detail later. Uh, uh, now let me just formulate this statement. Uh, and uh, let me consider the third example, which uh, third example before passing to the general theory. In fact, I would like to consider the discrete Bessel kernel uh, 
which we heard in the talk of Tomohiro Sasamoto, and just the discrete sine kernel, I would like to consider them in the way in which they, in fact, appeared. So I would like to consider now, so uh, the discrete Bessel kernel and the discrete sine kernel, the discrete Bessel kernel and the discrete sine kernel, and the discrete sine kernel. Uh, Johansson and Borodino Konkov and Shansky. So uh, let us uh, consider the young graph. So the young graph is the graph of young diagrams. is the graph of Young diagrams. Uh, maybe I should draw it the other way. Uh, they are arranged into a graph in such a way that uh, the diagrams with n cells form layer n of the graph, so it's a graded graph, and uh, an, an arrow goes from a diagram to a diagram below if uh, the diagram below can be obtained from the diagram above by adding one cell. And indeed, uh, for some time, uh, it is only, so the young graph, uh, uh, first short sec section of the young graph looks like uh, what, what is called Pascal graph, so it is either possible to add a diagram on the right, a cell on the right or on bottom, so as here, but already at level four, this is no longer the case. So, and uh, so already on level four, one sees that the young graph is much more complex than the Pascal graph, than the Pascal triangle. So, and in fact, this complexity, of course, only increases as the number of Young diagram grows, and we can recall the formula of euler hardy ramanujan that the number of uh, diagrams in the Young graph is roughly exponential of 2 pi over 6 square root of n, where, by the way, uh, this only means on logarithmic scale, so there are other terms also. Okay. No, excuse me, I think I said this incorrectly. No, I mean, of course, obviously on multiplicative scale, the euler hardy ramanujan formula holds, but the formula that I will write later only holds on logarithmic scale. Excuse me, I misspoke. Okay, so then uh, this young space of young diagrams, one endows with a Plancherel measure. So, and just to keep the exposition elementary, let me denote by dim lambda uh, the number of paths the number of paths of paths from the root from the root of the young graph from the root so from the diagram uh, from the root to lambda so uh, of course we know that this is also the dimension of the irreducible representation of the symmetric group which uh, so the representation which corresponds to lambda but again this explains the notation dim lambda, and this explains the formula, which, however, can also be obtained in purely elementary combinatorial way, that sum of dim square lambda is equal to n factorial. So sum over lambda in yn. So here yn is the nth level of the Young graph. Uh, so the, <coughs> the nth level of the Young graph. So then the Plancherel measure is the measure which assigns uh, to the nth level of the Young graph, assigns weight dim square lambda over n factor. So this is the Plancherel measure. Uh, this is the Plancherel measure that we shall consider. And... Uh, 
So the study of the properties of the Planchet-Rel measure is uh, uh, a fascinating subject of asymptotic representation theory. And one of the first results here is the theorem about the limit shape of Logan Shep and Vershek Kerov. Uh, Vershek Kerov. So, which says that in fact, the shape of the Young diagram, of the Plancherel Young diagram, so there is for Plancherel Young diagrams an analog of the law of large numbers, or we can also say an analog of the Wigner uh, semicircle, uh, semicircle law. And uh, uh, I sh one should say that while there has been very interesting work of Okunikov, uh, the reason why young diagrams behave like random matrices, well, there are many experts in the audience who can correct me, but to me remains obscure. So uh, the, we shall see in this example that uh, the uh, ensembles are uh, very, exhibit a very similar behavior, but why this happens, again, I cannot explain that. So uh, uh, the limit shape theorem of Logan, Shep, Vershek, and Kerov is the following. So uh, I draw, uh, it will be convenient for me to draw the Young diagram uh, the Russian way. So this is the British way. There also exists the French way, which is obviously different. Uh, but the most convenient will be uh, rotating it by 45 degrees as this stresses the symmetries between columns and rows. And this is what we shall do. And so then uh, the graph of the Young diagram is graph of a piecewise linear function piecewise linear function. So, uh, and uh, the graph of the piecewise linear function is uh, uh, approaches as uh, uh, n goes to infinity and suitably rescaled. Please allow me to skip uh, precise formulations in this case also. Uh, in fact, I will give precise formulation of a next result and uh, this will uh, also uh, cover this case. So uh, rescaling, rescaling uh, the graph of the Young diagram by square root of n, uh, by square root of n, so make it rescaling by square root of n, uh, one obtains the, one obtains the uh, graph of a fixed function omega of t. So by the way, function which lives on the interval from minus 2 to 2, just in the same way as the semicircle of Wigner. And also, by the way, the graph of the function, this omega t, uh, this function, let me not write the explicit formula, uh, uh, but it, it, this is just antiderivative of the arc sine. This is antiderivative of the arc sine. So please observe that antiderivative of the arc sine uh, if you think about the graph of the arc sine, it is, of course, a continuous function. Well, our functions are by definition continuous. Uh, nonetheless, it has a uh, discontinuity of the derivative, a discontinuity of the derivative uh, in these points. And uh, uh, yes, and uh, uh, this is precisely the edge of the diagram, the edge of the diagram. So this is the transition from the bulk to the edge just in the same way as in the case of random matrices. And let me just say, uh, let me just say very briefly uh, that what motivated Logan and Shep and Vershek and Kerf, what motivated them to consider this uh, problem. So it's a little digression which I allow myself, so uh, it is, uh, will not be used in what follows, but just I think it's an interesting anecdote. So in fact, they were solving what is called the Ulam problem. So the Ulam problem is the following problem. What is the longest increasing subsequence in a random permutation? So one takes a random permutation and one is interested in increasing subsequence. It is typical to say here something like when you board a plane, obviously uh, the thing that stops you is the person who is ahead of you, but in fact you sit behind him or her and so uh, before that person places the luggage, you cannot move ahead. So precisely, this is what, you know, if everybody came in order, then the plane would board immediately, but in practice, we know it doesn't. So in short, uh, the uh, longest increasing subsequence is in fact, uh, uh, so to speak, the sequence of passengers who arrive in order. 
So uh, the question of the longest increasing subsequence is the Ulam problem, is the Ulam problem. And in fact, it was discovered by Hammersley in the 50s that the longest increasing subsequence uh, has a order at least square root of n. And it was conjectured that in fact it is constant times square root of n. And in fact, uh, it was proved that it is two square root of n. And so I would like to point out that as I said, uh, so the theorem about the limit shape. So yes, excuse me, before, before I go into that, uh, one more clarification. So it turned out that the problem about random permutations should be studied in terms of a problem about Young diagrams through what is called the robinson shenzel knut correspondence. In fact, there is a bijection, there is a bijection between set of random permutations and set of Young diagrams according to which the uniform measure on random permutations is taken onto the Plancherelle measure on the space of Young diagrams. So uniform measure of permutations is taken to the Plancherelle measure on the space of Young diagrams. And this uh, correspondence can be uh, very vaguely explained in the following terms. So imagine just that a group, uh, one can say of military people, but maybe let's say mathematicians, uh, comes from lunch to this room. But, you know, mathematical community is very hierarchical. There is the most important mathematician, so number one, number two, and so on. So they arrive and then take seats. And so obviously the most important person has to sit in the corner, and then uh, the less important one cannot sit ahead of the more important one. But they arrive from lunch in random order. So maybe some not very important mathematician sits and takes the most important place. So then obviously when a more important one comes, he has to give his place to... to uh, let his place to let the other one, and so he moves. And then there are, so obviously when the whole process finishes, there is a young diagram, how the people are seated. But in fact, there is a path. So you can say, of course, there is a path, namely, but there are, in fact, there are two paths. There is a path order in which people arrive. But there is also a path, so there is Sherlock Holmes, who is sitting under the room and looking, but he doesn't see who arrives when. He sees order in which seats are occupied. So there are two paths. And these two paths, in fact, determine the random permutation uniquely. And this is the Robinson, uh, Robinson Shenstedt Knut correspondence. So just the, but the point is that Plancherel measure correspond, this is just what I said is maybe not complete proof, but what uh, I formulated is a very precise statement, that just uniform measure on permutations uh, under the robinson shenstedt knut correspondence is taken to the Plancherel measure on the space of Young diagrams, and it turns out, in fact, as the solution of the Ulam conjecture showed, that the Plancherel measure is the uh, right object. So it is much more convenient to consider the Plancherel measure rather than the uh, uniform measure on the space of permutations because of much more structure than the Plancherel measure has. So, and uh, let me... Uh, pursue my digression. So, in fact, so as I said, these teams, so there was the team of Logan Shep in the United States and the team of Verge Kerov in the USSR, and they were uh, both working on this problem, but in fact, the Logan Shep only proved the lower estimate, and Verge Kerov proved both sides, so they proved that, in fact, the length is 2 square root of n, and the difference, and this is, this is the story that I would like to stress, the difference is an observation whose proof, okay, so they were working many years on this conjecture. The difference is an observation which occupies one line and the proof also occupies one line. So one line of the observation is the following, that the Plancherel measures form a mark of chain. The Plancherel measures form a mark of chain. Measures form a mark of chain. So, uh, a mark of chain. So it is possible, uh, I, I will not write them explicitly uh, because we will not have time to investigate this Markov chain, but it is possible to introduce transition probabilities on the Young graph in such a way that the Plancherel measure of level n is taken to Plancherel measure of level n plus one. So there is a Markov chain, a, a Markov chain of Plancherel measures. And in fact, this, uh, as I say, this is a remark which takes one line to formulate and uh, one line to write the transition probabilities, the verification is immediate, but this is precisely what made the difference between lower estimate and upper estimate in the Ulam problem. So let me formulate uh, the theorem of Vershek and Kerov is that the longest increasing subsequence has length two square root of n. So longest increasing subsequence over longest increasing subsequence over square root of two subsequence 
over square root of n goes to 2, as n goes to infinity. So goes, it means improbability in measure, in measure. So it's a statement similar in spirit to the law of large numbers. So there is law of large numbers. Okay, so this statement uh, uh, they formulated and proved. And this 2 is, in fact, the same 2. So this is this 2. Yes, so this is precisely. So, in fact, this theorem is, uh, so is essentially corollary, corollary with some uh, additions is corollary of the uh, theorem on the uh, limit shape of the Young diagram. So, in fact, uh, the longest, uh, the longest, uh, the longest, uh, excuse me, the longest line is two square root of n. So, let me explain the difference. So, what is the difference precisely? What is the difference between uh, the limit shape theorem and the uh, theorem about the longest increasing subsequence? The limit shape theorem does not exclude the possibility that the first line, you know, goes on for a very goes on way beyond. So it does not exclude this possibility because it does not contradict because the difference between rescaled graphs will be one, one over square root of n. It would not contradict the limit shape theorem. So in fact, the limit shape theorem, and this is what Logan and Shep proved, limit shape theorem implies lower bound. And precisely for the upper bound, the upper bound immediately follows from the Markov property. The upper bound is immediate from the Markov property. Okay. So after this, uh, Vershik and Karev, once they saw, uh, probably moved by uh, analogy, uh, most of all. Uh, so they decided to uh, investigate further random properties of the Plancherel measure. So in particular, they proved they proved that the maximum of Plancherel measure, that the maximum of Plancherel measure, so they proved that the maximum logarithm of the maximum of the Plancherel measure. So over square root of n, so square root of n is a natural scaling, so we take minus logarithm. So they proved that the maximum of this quantity over lambda, so the maximum of this quantity uh, is less than a certain constant. So please observe, so this is the theorem of Vershkin Karev, theorem of Vershkin Karev. So they observed, so that again by the Euler Hardy Ramanujan formula, the growth of the, young, of the number of young diagrams is uh, the number of young diagrams grows as an exponential of square root of n. But the measure is of course non-uniform. The Planchel measure is non-uniform in the space of young diagrams. So the question is, how much does the fattest young diagram eat? So it is clear that there are some very lean young diagrams. So the young diagram, which consists of a single column or of a single row, uh, has measure one over n factorial. So it is, its measure is super exponentially small. But the question is, what about the fattest diagram? And so Vershik told me that there were conjectures that the fattest diagram is in fact super exponentially fat. So that the fattest diagram eats a, a lot of the, so maybe uh, one over some polynomial of n or something like this. So it's uh, a lot of the weight. And in fact, uh, with Karev, they proved that this is not the case. This is not the case. Uh, the fattest diagram, still the, uh, the measure of uh, each diagram at least decays at least in a stretched exponential way. So the decay is at least stretched exponential, proved uh, Vershk and Karev. And then, so an obvious analogy in this situation is obviously an unfair coin. So let us think about an unfair coin. So let me actually uh, write this, write this. So if I consider an unfair coin, so just uh, the uh, probability of a word is just p to the number of ones and one minus p to the number of zeros. So, uh, how does the measure, how does the me is the measure in an unfair coin distributed? So the measure in an unfair coin is distributed in the following way. And this is a uh, law of large numbers, uh, but in fact, this reformulation is due to Shannon. And this is the Shannon asymptotic equidistribution of information. How is measure in an unfair coin distributed? So there is, so the coin is unfair. Uh, there are 
2 to the n. The total number of binary words is 2 to the n. 2 to the n. But in fact, the measure does not live on them. The measure lives on a smaller subset, namely of subsequences of, uh, on the set of subsequences of cardinality e to the hn, where h is the entropy. So h is the entropy. So it lives on a space, on a smaller, exponentially smaller subset. And in restriction to this exponentially smaller subset, it is asymptotically equidistributed. So again, this is where this asymptotic equidistribution should be understood in a logarithmic sense. So that is to say, it lives on a set of exponentially smaller cardinality. <coughs> exponentially smaller cardinality. So in fact, uh, cardinality which is between e to the h plus epsilon n and e to the h minus epsilon n. And the measure of each binary word is e to the minus hn. Again, in logarithmic sense. The logarithm of the measure divided by n converges to h. So this is just the Shen equidistribution theorem. And it is a direct one line corollary of the Bernoulli law of large numbers. But it took over 200 years to formulate this one line corollary. So in fact, the Shannon's work is from 1940. So, uh, now, so Vershik and Kerov, motivated by this uh, example, conjectured that <coughs> uh, the Plancherel measure obeys a similar result. So here is the Vershik Kerov conjecture. So it was conjectured in 1985. And it, the proof appeared in 2012. So just <coughs> uh, that, uh, for, let me formulate, there exists a constant h, say Vershkin Kerov, such that for any epsilon bigger than zero, so the Plancherel measure of the set of diagrams such that the information Information is produced at raised square root of n. Information. So I write the minus just in order to write positive quantities. Minus h is less than epsilon. So this probability Plancherel measure goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. As n goes to infinity. OK. Equivalently, equivalently. For any epsilon, for any epsilon bigger than zero, so I wrote for any epsilon bigger than zero, uh, there exists a set y n epsilon in y n such that the cardinality of the set, so such that the number of elements in this set is between e to the h plus epsilon square root of n h minus epsilon square root of n. And the measure on each element of the set. So is it possible to see here or not so much? Yes, yes, no, yes or no? No, OK, so let me write in a different way. Uh, so two, the cardinality of, for any lambda in y n epsilon. Uh, so the Plancherel measure of lambda is at least e to the minus h plus epsilon square root of n, and at most e to the minus h minus epsilon square root of n. So precisely like the sh is it okay now or not or not so much? Also not. Okay, let me write it somewhere else. Okay, excuse me. So okay, excuse me. So equivalently, OK, let me make a blind spot. I think my blind spot, it grows from class to class. OK, so equivalently, equivalently, uh, so for any epsilon, so there exists set y 
an epsilon in Y. Such that the cardinality of Y and epsilon, the H plus square root, Then, and for any lambda in y and epsilon, so the log of Plancherel, oh, let me write it like without log, so Plancherel, n of lambda is less than e to the minus h minus epsilon square root of n and greater than e to the minus h plus epsilon square root of n. Okay, so uh, this is just the Verschikarev conjecture proved in 2012. And <clears throat> just uh, let me say uh, that in the proof, and this is what I'm, this is the main point, in the proof precisely the main role is played by <clears throat> determinantal structure, by determinantal structure of the Plancherel measure. So, and to, I will not expose uh, the proof uh, of, the, uh, of the conjecture. Uh, I refer to the publication, but uh, just uh, the, I will, however, discuss, I would like, however, to discuss the local structure of the Young diagram. So here, in fact, again, uh, Bike, David, and Johansson, they were interested by the longest increasing subsequence, in fact, by the limit theorem for the longest increasing subsequence. And uh, uh, Borodino, Konkov, and Dalshansky also uh, discussed the behavior of the Young diagram in the bulk. And for my purposes, I only want to discuss, in fact, the behavior of the Young diagram in the bulk. So, in the bulk. in the bulk, and so, uh, in fact, so the observer places himself in a position, but in the bulk, in a position of the limit shape, not on the edge of it, but in the bulk, and asks himself, uh, what does he see? So how uh, to uh, pose this question precisely? We need to assign a configuration to a Young diagram, but this is easily done. Uh, so, uh, in fact, one can say that one, uh, so a configuration will be a configuration on Z. It is sometimes more convenient to consider uh, not integers, but half integers. So, Borodin, Konikov, Alshansky often consider half integers because obviously a half integer as opposed to an integer is either positive or negative. So, it's more convenient in considering uh, young diagrams. But in any event, integer, half integer, uh, however one prefers. So, and uh, in fact, the graph of the Young diagram, as I said, uh, the uh, Young diagram drawn the Russian way is a graph of a piecewise linear function. So the graph goes either up or down. So uh, when the graph goes down, we put a particle. When the graph goes up, we put a hole. When the graph goes up, we put a hole. So uh, graph goes down, we put a particle. Graph goes up, we put a hole. So to a diagram, we assign, I have a, a constructed a bijection between the set of diagrams, all young diagrams, and uh, a certain subset. So uh, as I have embedded the set of diagrams to a certain subset of binary sequences. A certain subset of binary sequences. So there is, if I put a zero, it's a, it's a hole. If I put one, it's a particle. And so let us observe that this set of binary sequences is quite special, namely, this set is just the orbit, and by the way, this will play a role in, as this course progresses, is just the orbit, so which the image, the image, the image is the orbit of the infinite symmetric group, so the gr infinite symmetric group is the group of all finite permutations, applied to permutation, uh, applied, excuse me, to the sequence uh, corresponding to the uh, empty Young diagram. So the empty Young diagram, if there are no, no cells in my Young diagram, then the sequence will be like this. Particles in the positive half line and holes in the negative half line. And adding a cell corresponds to 
uh, adding a cell corresponds to, yes, it's the other way around, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the particles in the negative half line and the holes in the positive half line, thank you very much. So, and the, ac the, addition, the addition of a cell, quite clearly the addition of a cell, one can see it from the picture, the addition of a cell corresponds to a permutation of particle and hole. The addition of a cell corresponds to a permutation of particle and hole. And so the image of my set of Young diagrams under this embedding is the orbit of the infinite symmetric group on this sequence. And in fact, we will consider the orbits of the infinite symmetric group uh, in detail. So the fact that uh, our objects are invariant or quasi-invariant under the action of the infinite symmetric group will play a role in what follows in the Gibbs property, which I discussed last time, in the proof of the analog of the Gibbs property, which I discussed last time. And I would like just to point out that um, uh, now I have a point process, namely a point process on Z. So point process on Z is just a measure on collection of subsets of Z, which is the same thing as a measure on collection of binary sequences. Okay, so and now the main, the very important step forward, and so now after these preliminaries, I'm ready to formulate the definition of the Bessel, uh, of the Bessel point process. So the very important and amazing discovery of Johansson is that not the Plancherel measure, but the Poissonized Plancherel measure. So let me uh, let me write this. So let me consider the Poissonized Plancherel measure. Poissonized Plancherel measure. Let me write it like this. Poissonized with with a, with some coefficient eta, so I write e to the minus eta sum from zero to infinity, Plancherel n over uh, n factorial eta to the n. Yes. So Poissonized Plancherel measure is in fact a determinantal point process. So Poissonized eta. So this is theorem of Johansson. There are many proofs. So, for example, Bardino, Konkov, and Olshansky have a different proof, and Konkov has a yet different proof. There are many proofs of this theorem. So, that Poisson is a determinantal point process, is a determinantal point process. Point process with precisely with the discrete Bessel kernel with the discrete Bessel kernel, let me write it down. Discrete Bessel kernel. Bessel kernel. So uh, what do I mean by discrete Bessel kernel? So I write uh, J theta of x, y is, is uh, Theta square, let me write it. J theta of xy is theta over. Is theta over uh, jx plus 1 to theta jy. Y plus 1. Theta j is the standard Bessel function, so uh, just over x minus y. So this is the discrete Bessel kernel. Observe that the difference between classical Bessel kernel and discrete Bessel kernel is that here it is the index of the Bessel function that changes. It is the index of Bessel function that changes. Not the, mm, not the argument of the Bessel function, but the index of the Bessel function, as opposed to classical Bessel kernel, which we saw at talks several times yesterday, where it is, in fact, so here the parameters x and y are the 
arguments, not the arguments, but the indices of the Bessel function. So what do I mean when I say that this process is the terminal point process with Bessel kernel? So I can explain this quite explicitly. So this means that the probability that the following particles, so let me write the following particles, n1 and l belong to x. So uh, observe that here, so here in the discrete setting, I don't need uh, the um, uh, complicated formalism of correlation functions. I just consider cylindrical sets in my space of binary sequences, but cylindrical sets of a special form, namely cylindrical sets of the form that particles belong to my configuration. Some particles belong to my configuration. And this is, in fact, just the determinant of this kernel, j theta square n i n j, where eta is theta square. So there we go. So ij goes from 1 to l. Excuse me, question? Again? P is the Poissonnais Planchel measure. Yes, P is the Poissonnais Planchel. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, Poissonnais Planchel. Yes. So this is the Poissonnais Planchel. So more precisely, the image of the Poissonnais Poincharel under this, this embedding. Okay, so after this uh, formulation of this uh, beautiful theorem of Johansson, there is still the question of taking the limit, of taking the limit. So the theorem of Johansson, so please observe, again we can see in this example the uh, importance of the determinantal property. In fact, the formula is complicated. The interaction, between, the interaction between particles is complicated. It is given in this determinantal way. But observe that all the dependence is encoded in one function of two variables, namely the kernel, the kernel which generates the determinantal point process, this one. So observe also that, of course, Johansson's theorem, it contains information about all Planchel measures. So, because in fact, well, we took the Poissonization of Planchel measure. But of course, if we want to have Planchel measure of index n, one should just take the parameter eta equal to n. It is uh, standard that Poisson distribution lives in neighbor, uh, Poisson distribution lives in neighborhood of its average value, so of the parameter of the Poisson distribution. So it is concentrated, and there is central limit theorem, uh, so uh, it is concentrated in the neighborhood of its average value. And uh, so in order to obtain information about uh, Plancherel measure of order n, one should take eta equal n, and then, if I want information in the bulk, if I want information in the bulk of the Young diagram, then I need to study this Bessel kernel in the situation in which the parameter theta is square root of n. And x and y are also of order square root of n. But this is a very classical asymptotics. So the asymptotics of Bessel function, so j, so let me keep my notation. So uh, the asymptotic of jx of 2 theta, when theta over x, so 2 theta over x tend to some constant a. This is classical asymptotics. It is called the Debye asymptotics. Debye asymptotics. So, by the way, uh, Debye got Nobel Prize for this. So, Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, for this asymptotics. So, and uh, just um, <coughs> the, uh, uh, what is the term in the asymptotics? Well, it is the sine function. It is the sine function. So, uh, uh, the sine function. So uh, after this, uh, this preliminary discussion, we are ready to formulate the theorem of Borodino, Konikov, and Alshansky. Okay. 
So to formulate the theorem of Borodino, okay, Borodino, Kwinkoff, and Alshansky. Okay, so I need. So. Uh, which says that the, probab the Plancherel probability So, the Plancherel probability of the event that in positions a square root of n plus, let me write, I wrote n1, but in fact, maybe I wasn't wise in that. So, let me write k1. So a square root of n plus k1 a square root of n plus kl tends, as n goes to infinity, to, well, to the determinant, obviously tends to the determinant because a determinant must tend to a determinant. So the, all, the all, whole game is about convergence of kernels. Actually, excuse me, no, I was wise the first time, so I keep the n's, excuse me. So these will be the n's, excuse me. And those will be the case, excuse me. So the ends, excuse me, the ends are chosen in this form. And N1 is A square root of N plus K1, N2 and so on, and AL is A square root of N plus KL. Okay, so A, this is important, A is strictly between minus 2 and 2. And in fact, by the way, this is also clear in the Debye asymptotics. So if one approximates the uh, Bessel function of argument which, uh, uh, of index which nearly coincides with the argument, then in fact the, uh, uh, excuse me, then in fact the um, asymptotics of the Bessel function is no longer governed by the sine function, but in fact is governed by the Airy function. So uh, this is very clear on the level of corresponding equations because the equation degenerates and so somehow one develops a singularity. So it's, it doesn't converge to the equation for the sine function but converges to the equation for the area. To, uh, con uh, the, mm, the equation, the Bessel equation converges I under this limit not to the, well, standard equation x to dot equals x which gives the sine function but to the uh, airy equation. And so one obtains the airy function. Okay, so in any event, so uh, I continue. So this is determinant S alpha and I and J, uh, K I, excuse me. K I, K J, excuse me. I J one to L. So, uh, uh, yes. So K I K J and uh, <clears throat> so what does it mean S alpha? So S alpha of X Y. So it is quite similar. It is in fact a formula completely similar to the sine formula of uh, uh, Dyson. So there is a connection between alpha and A. So A over two is cosine alpha, yes, A over 2 is cosine alpha. So in fact, we can see that as we approach 1, as we approach 1, so uh, alpha, uh, so, so as we are in 0, alpha is pi over 2, this is good. As we approach 1, alpha goes to pi, in fact, uh, uh, excuse me, alpha goes to zero, uh, excuse me. As we approach two, alpha goes to zero, and in fact, there are fewer and fewer particles. As we approach minus two, so alpha goes to pi, and in fact, there are more and more and more particles. So, okay, so uh, uh, one can see that the formula makes perfect sense. And uh, just this is the theorem of Bradino, Kunikov, and Alshansky. So in the limit, in the bulk, of the uh, Young diagram, in the bulk of the Young diagram, uh, what I have is the 
uh, determinantal point process with the kernel, which is called discrete sign kernel. And by the way, quite in analogy with the, the this will be important as we proceed, uh, quite in analogy with the continuous sign kernel. So uh, the operator S alpha is a projection in L2, so I have to take my function, it's L in L2 of Z, so I have to take my function, I have to take its Fourier transform, which is now function on the circle, I have to restrict it to the interval, so circle is imagined in additive notation, I have to restrict it to the interval from minus alpha over two to alpha over two and take the inverse Fourier transform. So it is, in fact, a spectral projection uh, just as the continuous sine kernel is indeed a spectral projection. So let me just say that, so how, uh, let me just say uh, very briefly in the little time that remains to me, uh, how from the discrete sign kernel one proves uh, the Verschek Karov conjecture. In fact, uh, so the Verschek Karov conjecture, the proof, uh, the proof is based on a variational formula. So in fact, the proof of the theorem of Logan Shep and Verschek Karov, both of them, uh, did it this way. The proof is based on a variational formula. So the dimension of Planchel measure is represented as a certain functional for which they compute uh, the extremal, and this is the function omega, but for which they also they compute the quadratic variation. And so this is the variational formula. And the quadratic variation is expressed in as a sum of several terms. So it is very interesting to point out that the Sobolev norm, the Sobolev one-half norm of the function comes into the game. Sobolev one-half norm of the deviation of the graph with the limit shape enters the game. But also various, so since the dimension of, the dimension lambda is given in terms of the hook formula, the, the quantities that come into just determination of this function, so if we write down, just write down explicitly this function, uh, write it down explicitly, we obtain a certain expression which will involve in particular the local characteristics of Young diagram. What do I mean by local characteristics? I will formulate this precisely. For example, what uh, Karoff called number of corners in Young diagram. What does it mean, number of corners in Young diagram? Number of corners uh, means uh, well, number of corners, so this is a corner. So if you wish, uh, Young diagram encodes a partition, so this is number of distinct summons in the partition. So this is number of combination, particle, and then whole. So corners, so it's a combination, excuse me, whole, and then particle, so this is a corner. So this is a corner, so number of corners. And in fact, uh, one can prove that number of corners, according to Plancherel measure, converges to a constant, so this constant can be uh, computed. So number of corners, obviously one over square root of n, number of corners converges to a constant. So uh, also, uh, well, there are corners, there are also uh, particles with hook length k, so then can, there can be given uh, so number of, uh, number of situations like this, so when there is configuration at distance k, part, uh, whole and particle. So number of configurations when there is a whole, then distance k, and then there is a particle. So this over square root of n converges, it's possible to compute. Okay, there we go. So, uh, yes, and uh, I would like to point out so how does one obtain this formula, this kind of formulas? Uh, uh, how does one obtain this kind of formula? So as the borodino kolikov alchansky theorem shows, uh, as borodino kolikov alchansky theorem shows, uh, the Plancherel di young diagram looks like sign process, but in different positions of young diagram, one gets different sign processes. So the parameter of the sign process uh, slowly moves, slowly moves as one moves along the Young diagram. So in fact, what one needs to, when one computes these asymptotic quantities, what one needs to do is to take the average, to take the average of this quantity according to the sign process, and then average again under the parameter alpha, under the parameter alpha. And this is how one gets these explicit formulas. And then one needs to prove that in fact, 
the number converges to its expected value. And this has to do with the fact that determinantal point processes have small variance, a property that we will we already discussed in the first class and we'll discuss in great detail tomorrow. So just uh, the fact that somehow these, uh, these different parts of the Young diagram are, one can say in first approximation, independent. Uh, so uh, there is, the variance grows very slowly. So, and then, uh, in fact, they're not independent, they're negatively correlated. So, uh, and then just one obtains this convergence to a uh, constant. And then there are also some non-local terms which require separate analysis, but I skip that. And then from this convergence of local, stati of local statistics of a Young diagram, it is possible to prove such result for any local statistics, uh, any local statistics of Young diagram. From this, one arrives at the proof of the Verschek Karev conjecture. And please allow me to conclude with an open problem. So number of corners converges to a constant. But what about uh, the limit theorem for this quantity? Observe that this does not fall into the context of the Soshnikov limit theorem because it is not an additive functional. It is a polynomial functional of, so it's a function that depends of two, uh, two positions, not one position, but two positions. And, well, experts in the audience can correct me, but to the best of my knowledge, such limit theorems in general are not known. Thank you very much.